We're going to start with the Flippy Update. Flippy Update. Do you want fries with that? Yep, it's time for the Flippy Update. Flippy is the colloquial name for the disembodied robot arms that are taking our jobs, enslaving our children, and flirting with our spouses. We use talking about Flippy to examine how the robots are taking over everything and how there's nothing we can do about it. But how Bible prophecy foretold of such days, which brings us closer to the return of Jesus. I like putting my spin on this. I, I'm enjoying adding the little sprinkles into uh, Basil's little thing. Uh, today... We have a story from spectrum.ieee.org, and I thought this was interesting because uh, we've done flippy updates for years now, and it's rare that we talk about the origins of the the robot arm, but this article came out on August 30th, 2020, so I thought I'd do a little rundown just to get a feel for where all of this started, and the headline here is, in 1961, the first robot arm punched in. The era of industrial robots began with Unimate at a GM plant in Trenton. Mm -hmm. Here's what it says. When they met at a cocktail party, 1956. Oh, 1956 cocktail party. Sounds so innocent compared to what we see now. George Duvall and Joseph Engelberger instantly bonded over their love of science fiction, happily chatting about Isaac Asimov and his theories on robotics. Then the conversation turned more serious. Two years earlier, Duvall had filed a patent for a general purpose manipulator for performing repetitive tasks, and he was looking for a financial backer. Engelberger was curious about how to apply flexible machines for factory automation. By the end of the evening, a plan was in motion that would change the world of manufacturing. Ooh, change the world. Duvall and Engelberger seemed an unlikely pair. Duvall was an inventor and entrepreneur who had founded several companies to uh, commercialize his various inventions. After graduating from high school in 1932, he had started United Cinephone. Ooh, he started it in 1933, maybe? To improve sound quality on the new talking motion pictures. (laughs) Oh, see how innocent they were? It's not TV. It's not. It's not TikTok videos. It was... Talking motion pictures. He quickly moved on to other inventions, including the Phantom Doorman, an automated door opening system, a proximity controlled laundry press, the patent for which was withheld by the U.S. government through World War II, and the Speedy Weenie, a vending machine that dispensed hot dogs cooked by microwaves. Wow. (laughs) Speedy Weenie. Meanwhile, Engelberger was pursuing a more traditional corporate career. He had earned a bachelor's degree in physics in 1946 and a master's in electrical engineering in 1949, both from Columbia University. When he met Duvall, he was working as an engineer for Manning, Maxwell, and Moore, a company that specialized in safety valves, pressure gauges, and other industrial control equipment. But that soon changed. Man, they're really good with these like last sentences that are so dramatic. Shortly after the cocktail party, the two men founded Unimation. Hold on. He's at a cocktail party and he just graduated high school. He either graduated high school late or there was no, I mean, I guess different time. Uh, So yes, after the cocktail party, the two men founded Unimation. They name a, wait, 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 the name, a portmanteau, portmanteau of universal and automation, which Duvall had coined when filing his patent. The pair needed funding. A year later, Engelberger founded Consolidated Controls Corp., in an attempt to keep his former team from Manning, Maxwell, and Moore together after M.M. and M. liquidated the aerospace division that Engelberger had led, Engelberger then convinced Norman Schaffler, CEO of Condec Corp., a parent company of Consolidated Controls, to finance the development of Duvall's invention. Condec eventually purchased Unimation in 1960 and bought Duvall's patent when it was finally issued the next year. While Duvall's patent was pending, a team of six men set out to turn his idea into a reality. They decidedly, uh, they decided initially to build the mechanical arm with five degrees of freedom. This later evolved into a six axis machine. I wonder if it has six fingers too, uh, that emulated the human shoulder, elbow and wrist. Yeah, probably not. Uh, it had a self-contained hydraulic supply operating at 6.9 megapascals, 
thousand pounds per square inch. The men had to invent both the programming controls and memory systems, as well as the digital optical encoders for determining shaft position. Uh, weighing in at about 1,360 kilograms, that's about 3,000 pounds, the prototype was a beast. But it could pick up parts of up to 100 pounds. Later models could handle objects five times as heavy. The Unimate was both squatter and w- squatter and wider than the average worker, meaning 1.6 meters high, 1.2 meters wide, and 1.5 meters deep. And it shows a video here from the Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan. And I, I gotta tell you, the the uh, the robot arm is uh, pretty pretty remarkable when you consider where we are today. The Unimation is uh, just a ginormous arm thing that <laughs> I mean, it does look like it's from the 60s so yeah no surprises but uh you, you, there's some photos of it in action but uh yeah this thing was dangerous i'm sure it, it could take out an entire an entire kitchen of people if this was the flippy in the kitchens now the, now it's much more sleek it's smaller it's a uh, its range of motion isn't as intense but uh yeah clearly they had a lot of this figured out by the 1960s The article continues, although programmable, the original Unimate did not have a programming language. Instead, the user would move the machine head to the desired location and a position detector would record the spot. The user user would repeat this process to record a sequence of events that the Unimate could play back. When Unimate acquired Victor Scheinman's Vicarm robot, it also acquired the robot's programming language, VAL. Beginning in 1973, Val became a part of Unimation's industrial robots. Uh, goes on here. There's a couple more things to mention. Uh, I thought I had some stuff highlighted. I don't know if they disappeared. I'm keep going. Oh, uh, there's a photo here of the. You know, if you if if you didn't know what it was, the Unimate arm looks kind of like a blast. You know those those uh, stationed blasters on Star Wars, like like on the uh, Death Star. That's kind of what it looks like. It's got a big old arm thing. It's uh, and then you know it's a little headpiece that spins around. Um, okay, where does it say? 1970, Unimation expanded into human scale robotic arms when it acquired Vicarm, which it rebranded the programmable universal machine for assembly or Puma. The company worked with General Motors to develop Puma for light assembly work. Goes on here. In 1983, Condex sold Unimation to Western Electric for $107 million. And then, uh, although the Unimit uh, debuted in the United States, it built its reputation in Japan and helped propel the use of industrial robots there. By the mid-1980s, Japan had become a robot kingdom, boasting nearly 70% of all the robots in the world. Robots have since spread across the globe, and or pancake, whatever you know, believe it is, uh, and transformed many industries. But the spark was a chance conversation over cocktails. And, you know, we always talk about, why, Basil always had that question, why is Japan the, the bedrock of robots? Well, little did we know that it was from a robot arm. It was, the, the, the seed was planted in Japan from the OG Flippy. So, uh, again, you know, we don't plan these things. We, we don't know all the research before we dive into a topic, but we seem to be asking the right questions when it comes to the origins. Uh, and there's a photo here of Joseph Engelberger and George Duvall, the two who started the, the, or, you know, the vision of the robot arm and made it a reality. And, you know, there's just a couple of fellas, uh, a nice suit, one in a bow tie, one in a regular suit and tie, a uh, handkerchief in pocket. And the image has a robot arm serving them a drink and uh, just very indicative of the the source, the origin of all of this. It's pretty wild to think that it's just uh, over cocktail uh, over, you know, just just in a bar where the best ideas are <laughs> sparked, I guess. But not everybody executes on. Right. So, uh, yeah, uh, they must have had more than just financial assistance. They probably had some kind of spiritual assistance. And uh, that's something that we've been tracking as well, because well before all of this, it what was this 19. What year was it? I'm sorry. I, I 1949. I guess it was right about the No, 1993. Or, da, 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 OK, hold on. When did this happen? 
56, I'm sorry, 1956. So if we're thinking, I'm thinking about the Norbert Weiner book. Um, oh gosh, what was it called? Can't remember off the top of my head. I'm going to have to look it up. But Norbert Weiner, he is considered the father of cybernetics. And he was writing around that same time talking about automation and loops and everything else. Yeah, so he was born in 1894 and he passed away in 1964. So let's see, Norbert Weiner, The Human Use of Human Beings, Cybernetics. Is that his first book? Yeah, I don't have it all in front of me here. But uh, let's see, let me try to find it. Uh, da, 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 da. Mm, that says 1980. That must be a republish. Anyway, uh, oh, yes, this is the one that was really interesting by Norbert Weiner, especially the cover. Um, the, the, the book is titled God and Gollum Inc. A comment on certain points where cybernetics. I can't read the rest of that title. <laughs> oh, man. 1966. So, OK, uh, after the fact, after the meeting took place. Uh, in any case, it was all it's all in the same era. Post 19 for post World War II uh, reconstruction. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot to be discussed there in terms of the origins, but there you go. That's our flippy update for today. Just a little origin story. And we'll have to remind Basil to check this segment out because I feel like we're going to reference this more often as, uh, more flippy updates. Uh, can we continue to do flippy updates anyway, moving forward? So there you go. Flippy update for today.